Every state has one. A blood-curdling boogeyman. He has hooves for his feet, large wings. It has a hairy, devilish hand. This is a four-legged monstrosity. But which local legend brings the biggest fright? Mothman. We're talking about a figure that's seven feet tall, glowing red eyes. Light on it. You scared the hell out of me my whole life. The black-eyed children, once you invite them in, all hell breaks loose. We're taking you from coast to coast to meet the scariest monsters in the U.S. He's huge, um, and he's fast, and he's dangerous. By all accounts, this creature should have come out of Dr. Frankenstein's lab. From a sinister sea creature... That's what's causing these drownings. ...to a horrifying home invader... They would hear the sound of chains rattling and the sounds of knocks on the wall. From a legendary swamp monster. There you are. To a cunning cannibal. It needs to eat. It needs to feed. We've narrowed it down to ten, but only one can reign supreme. Will your state monster make the cut? It's the scariest most terrifying, deadliest monster I hope you never encounter. Join us, if you dare, as we count down the most haunted, bloodthirsty, and wicked monsters America has ever seen. Mountain's majesty. But lurking in the shadows of this picturesque landscape are the beasts of our collective nightmares. Scary narratives kind of follow us around. Accounts of ghosts, of monsters. There's new ones coming all the time. Stories that we've not yet found the evidence for. Maybe we never will. If we take these stories at their word, you know, we're dealing with something much more bizarre than we could ever imagine. But which mysterious being sends the biggest shivers down your spine? Our journey to find the scariest monster starts along the sprawling plains of the Lone Star State, where we find number 10 on our list, a four-legged vampire that's striking fear in the South. It's the Texas Chupacabra. The Chupacabra's name means the goat sucker. The Chupacabra does have an unsettling appearance, almost as though it's a hybrid of an alligator and a wolf. It has very sharp teeth, really sharp pointy ears, but at the same time, reptile-like feet. This is a four-legged monstrosity, a wild animal trying to survive out there devouring livestock, draining the blood from them with two bites on its neck. I mean, it sucks your blood. That's typical vampire behavior. The first recorded sightings of this ferocious beast were in the early 1990s when farmers began noticing dead livestock and a strange creature roaming closely nearby. I never expect something like this to happen down here, but... For Jeannie Torres, it was a frightening discovery. Sixteen of her chickens found dead inside their coop. At first, she thought it might have been a dog that managed to get to her birds. But after examining them, she says she's convinced it was the work of the chupacabra. You see, each chicken has a puncture wound, and legend has it that's the trademark of the chupacabra. The chupacabra is one of the more recent animals or monsters in the field of the supernatural. 
only dating back a few decades. The original description was something bipedal with a large kind of elongated skull, more humanoid in appearance. Spikes running down its back, glowing red eyes, sharp teeth. Three to four feet tall and kind of large almond-shaped eyes, so more alien-like. I think most cryptids are based in our primal fears, and then they evolve and evolve with stories. A cryptid is basically an unhuman figure. And of course, many of these cryptids can take human form or can possess human in nature, but it's basically this idea of a monster, and it has a narrative or a legend that attaches itself to it. Like the Bible, a lot of these legends are told as motif with lessons, valuable life lessons, whether ironic, humorous, or frankly, quite frightening. Supernatural creatures give us a way to put a face and a body and a name to things that go bump in the night, things that make us feel afraid or uh, make us feel uncomfortable in ways that we can't quite put a finger on. But those that have experienced the chupacabra for themselves have come to know a different truth. You can't rule out a story because you think it's too weird because when you're dealing with the weird, what is too weird? Where is that line? The African mountain gorilla was considered a crypto creature mythology until about 1905 when the mountain gorillas were finally documented by scientists and everyone could see they really existed. They were not uh, a myth. There's always this evolving relationship with the world around us where we think we figured it out and then something happens that completely rearranges our understanding all over again. Skeptics claim the chupacabra is merely a mangy dog or a rabid coyote. But these Texas golf course workers feel differently after discovering what some believe to be a dead chupacabra along a wooded driving range. I don't know. <laughs> it's just weird. Weird animal. It was like a shaved weenie dog with raccoon feet, a possum tail, and a possum head. If you look at the claws on it and the feet, nothing like it. I've never seen anything like it. I don't know. I don't know what, what it is. Most of the witnesses they're avid outdoorsmen and women. They're hunters, they're trappers, they're hikers. They know the local wildlife. They're adamant. They're entirely convinced that this creature is something not of any known species. And they've got proof. With the Chupacabra being one of the only cryptids ever successfully captured on camera. What is the, oh man. Hello. The most infamous footage was caught on a dash cam of a police car where they're following behind what looks like to be the El Chupacabra running down the side of a road. I'm seeing it, but I don't believe it. It's in the daytime. We have plenty of eyewitness video evidence, photographic evidence of these alleged monsters roaming about. The sightings, the encounters, the capturing of chupacabras seem to be rising every single year. Some of the alleged dead chupacabras have tested to be coyotes or a fox with mange, but others of these seem to be bigger than what you would consider a coyote and more hideous. The fangs seem to be long, the claws deadly long and sharp. Again, placing it in a category of not just your typical unknown species. I wouldn't be surprised if this animalistic creature had multitudes of itself, if there was offspring, if there was groups and families, and maybe they hunt in packs. There could be a lot of chupacabras roaming around. The chupacabra has a long history of going after livestock. Cows, sheep, chickens, and especially goats. But what many believers fear is that these bloodthirsty predators have been working their way up the food chain. 
In 2020, a cab driver was killed and found reportedly without any blood in him. And reports were circulating that it was a chupacabra attack. That's very scary to think about. I, I would not be surprised if these chupacabras start feasting on human beings. Because it's relatively diminutive that you might be thinking, I could probably out-wrestle this thing. But our next creatures prove that size doesn't matter when you're dealing with the supernatural. We're traveling to one of America's smallest states, where some even smaller monsters are bringing the biggest fright yet. And if that's not enough to leave you battening down the hatches, stick around. Because the monster at the top of our list is so terrifying, people are already building up defenses against it. It still has the prisoner partition, it has the plastic seats in the back, it has steel door panels and window bars, and we've also added the canine window bars in the back window, which are super rare if you could break out of a regular car door if you wanted to. We're tracking down the top 10 giants, ghosts, and ghouls that keep Americans up at night. But sometimes, the scariest monsters aren't the ones with mangled faces or razor-sharp claws. They're the ones that appear innocent and sweet until the moment they attack. That's the case with our next state monster, who comes in at number 9 on our list. Beware the haunting gaze of the Vermont Black-Eyed Children. The Black-Eyed Children. Ooh, that one's a creepy one. In the late 1990s, people started reporting sightings and encounters of unusual children. But unlike the California Dark Watchers, who attack travelers at random, these roaming terrors take a more calculated approach with their prey. It doesn't matter where you are. You could be at a stoplight, you could be at home, you could be at school, but wherever you are, somehow there's these kids that appear. The descriptions are varied, but some details stay the same. The kids are always pale. They travel in pairs, and they all have one goal. They want in some way to be welcomed or let into wherever your location is. Now, this harkens somewhat back to almost vampire lore or demonic lore in that they seem to be asking permission to come in the person's home. You go open the door, Dracula will stand there until you say, come in. The black-eyed children possess that same quality. You have to invite them in. And then once you invite them in, all hell breaks loose. Imagine your quiet night at home is interrupted by a series of knocks at the front door. The knocks come in threes. A mocking of the Holy Trinity. And they don't let up until someone answers. And they ask the people to let them in. Please let me in. And they get more and more aggressive, apparently, the more that you say no to them. That's exactly what happened to an elderly woman in rural Vermont on a snowy night in the early 1990s. They approached her and said, can we use the bathroom? Now, of course, if you see a couple of children in there like, I need help, of course, the first thing that you're going to think of is, come into my home. Let me help you in any way that I possibly can. But even before the woman welcomes the children inside, she can see that something is not right. And at that point, she noticed that their eyes were pitch black. When confronted by the gaze of a grown-up, these tiny visitors will look away. But that's just part of their manipulative ploy. Once eye contact is made, they're dealing with something that is just unnatural, that is not quite human. People report that they sound robotic or unnatural. They use terms that aren't completely current with the time, and they just don't seem like normal children. The woman eventually caves and allows the children into her home. That's when things start to get really strange. 
when she runs to her husband, the husband's nose is bleeding profusely. The cat was going crazy. It was angry and it was jumping around. But just as soon as they arrived, the children are gone. Still, the terror continues. The nose bleeding never really stops. The woman gets cancer. The cat is found dead in a pool of its own blood. Some people believe that these things are sinister and that they are bringing the misfortune to those they encounter. People have lost pets. They've gotten really dark diagnosis of, of sickness. People have gotten in car accidents right after seeing them. And the encounters stretch even beyond the Vermont state border. In Abilene, Texas, apparently there was a police officer that came across these black-eyed children in the road, and they started banging on the car, and you have to let us in or else. And of course, like any person, he, this police officer was very terrified. He was like, I don't feel safe, and he drove off. And apparently in his rearview mirror, those children were nowhere to be seen. Which is why some believe they aren't children at all. Some people believe that they're an alien-human hybrid. When you look at the black-eyed children, if you remove their hair, they look exactly like the shape-shifting grays aliens. There's something unearthly about looking into eyes like that because people report that they feel like they're staring into a void or staring into nothingness or staring into darkness. Darkness in the sense that it feels very negative and very ominous. So others believe that there's something from the depths of hell, something demonic that has manifested on Earth for whatever nefarious reason. They are bringing death to people's doors. Most likely these are demonic entities that just kind of skip around history and try to show what they believe a child would look like during this period. And a lot of times they're just guessing. So that's why the appearance is kind of off at all times. There's some kind of spiritual evil that is personified. Maybe it is the devil trying to find its way in. So it leaves us with this puzzle that we can't quite figure out what these children maybe are supposed to be. One thing is for certain, you wouldn't want to come face to face with them. And I'd be very scared if I saw them at my door, the, these little children with very, very dark eyes. So, if you find yourself in the Green Mountain State, how do you protect yourself against the black-eyed children? They don't just come into your house. They don't just do that. They always knock. And if the person does not give permission, the children don't intrude. And here's the thing with the black-eyed children. Their approach usually knocks their victims off balance. They're looking at children that are appearing harmless, helpless, and in need, and then you find out that they're not harmless. How do you respond? So that makes them extremely dangerous. As conniving as these creepy children may be, there's still a chance of avoiding their calls if you're savvy enough to say no. That's not the case for our next state monster. A terror in the water that you'll never see coming. From the highest peaks to the lowest valleys, we're leaving no stone unturned in our hunt for the scariest monsters in America. We've traveled to the plains of Texas and the porches of homes in suburban Vermont. Up next, we're headed to the fresh lakes of Oklahoma, where we're diving in to find number eight on our list. An eight-armed anomaly that wreaks havoc on unsuspecting swimmers. It's the Oklahoma octopus. The Oklahoma octopus is an octopus or a creature that resembles an octopus that is the size of a horse that is 200 pounds with eight long octopus legs that is extremely strong. 
So the origin of where this octopus suddenly appeared were these three lakes, Lake Ulaga, Lake Tenkiller, and Lake Thunderbird. It's the octopus hunter. I've just returned from leading a tour group on a tour of the lair of the Oklahoma octopus. I've been called a madman, a lunatic, Captain Ahab chasing his morbid Moby Dick, except it's an octopus and not a whale. Oklahoma truly is a unique space. You know, I don't remember the first time I heard of the Oklahoma octopus. But I know it's real. I've heard numbers. The death toll from drownings, unexplained, has risen 138%. I'll hunt it, track it, capture it, not to kill it, but for science. The Oklahoma octopus, like a Loch Ness monster, very few people see these creatures, but their existence is always spoken about. But there's one particular encounter that first put the Oklahoma octopus on the map. And it wasn't that long ago. 2007, a little boy swims out too far into this lake. Now they're trying to rescue the little boy who begins to say something is pulling me down. As rescuers and family members and the like are trying to get this boy, he poof, disappears in the lake never to be found. Soon rumors spread about what lurks beneath the lake's placid waters. What ended up spurring these rumors was the amount of different people, like the amount of deaths, the drownings, like what's causing these drownings. They almost work like how seaweed would work, where basically if you get your leg caught, the arm of the octopus is grabbing you and pulling you down. Some survivors have said it was the Oklahoma octopus. They've witnessed it. They've seen it. Some people even went as far as saying they felt it pulling them under the water, those who were able to get away. But these sightings aren't just a recent thing. Hundreds of years ago, Tales emerged of a giant octopus in Oklahoma that terrorized indigenous people fishing on the local waterways. They have a legend of a similar creature, same size, same description, red skin, but theirs is a demonic marine life entity that would kill you if you came to the lake stream water to bathe or drink. And there have been tales of this giant octopus, this red leathery octopus with long tentacles, the size of a horse, basically dwelling in these lakes. With so many documented sightings, the Oklahoma octopus seems to have some edge over similar creatures, like Nebraska's Walgren Lake monster and the Lake Worth monster in Texas. But there's one detail that still bothers skeptics. There is a huge issue there trying to figure out how exactly um, something which is a saltwater animal could exist in fresh water. There's some people who say, well, you know, a jellyfish or a catfish or this or that put in a different atmosphere can adapt. It's possible for animals and creatures to adapt to new surroundings. We know this, we've seen this. What if this actually is something that's purposefully trying to take you out? I don't want to be a part of that number. I would say it's demonic. It's possibly taking souls. The Oklahoma octopus may have you thinking twice about taking a dip anytime soon. But deep in the marshes of the southern U.S., even dry land can be dangerous when number seven on our list is lying in wait. 
ready to attack anyone whose morals have started to slip. It's the Louisiana Rougarou. The Rougarou is Louisiana's version of the werewolf. It's bipedal. It's torso heavy, canine head, the dog-like ears, anywhere between six to nine feet tall. Brown fur or gray fur, sometimes black. Just very tall, upright wolf stalking the swamps at night. In the swamp, there's something standing up on the bank over there. There you are. Look how tall, bruh. Just wanted to show y'all what the Rugaru is. This is a type of a, a creature that is seen as a shapeshifter. It has the, the body of a man, um, but the head of a wolf or a dog. Like their brethren, the werewolf, the Rougarou is able to conceal its identity as a human during the day. But at night, this hairy brute transforms into a violent predator that's only after one thing. The blood of an ill-practicing Christian. The Rougarou targets people who aren't observing Lent correctly. It's very closely tied to moral behaviors and to expected social behaviors, especially um, behaviors related to Catholicism. In many ways, it can be viewed as a manifestation of shame. The main course of action for the Rougarou is going to be to attack. They bite, scratch, attack, or draw blood from another human. Once infected by this feral beast, you face a fate more frightening than death. Becoming a Rougarou yourself. That's not the case for all the cryptids, but in this particular case, that is a very, very important part of the Rougarou story, that you are cursed to become a Rougarou. Which means that any number of Rougarou could be walking amongst us today. You have great stories, like the story of the young boy in Louisiana and was being pursued by a dog. The dog would not stop pursuing this young boy, and the young boy uh, ends up cutting the dog on his front leg. Then the dog gets away, and later on that day, the town physician shows up with a cut on his shoulder that he has bandaged up and saying, hey, what's going on? What's happening? And so it was very strong suspicion that that physician was the Rigaru himself. Unlike the Michigan Dogman or Wisconsin's Beast of Bray Road, the Rougarou has roots tracing far beyond America's borders. It actually has its origins, both in name and in behavior and shape, in the French Lugaru, which is a werewolf from the Middle Ages. Traveling to America with Louisiana's first settlers, the French wolf soon got an American makeover. Rougarou kind of sounds almost like a butchered pronunciation of Loup Garou. The Rougarou, we get that from the Cajun accent. Everything kind of just gets smoother when you get to Louisiana. When the legend moved to Louisiana, that kind of ties into witchcraft and voodoo and all of that good stuff we get out of Louisiana. Now lurking in the Louisiana bayou, this monstrous creature is as murky as the swamp itself. So you have gators, large spiders, frogs. It just feels like everything is alive in that place. If you set a foot wrong, you could disappear. And so the Ruger is an embodiment of that wildness and that unpredictability of the Louisiana landscape. Over the years, the Rougarou survives by keeping a low profile, which is why it is one of the lesser known cryptids on record. You're a human by day, you're a Rougarou by night. So if somebody is attacked by a Rougarou, it's likely somebody you go to school with, somebody you work with, somebody you're seeing on the daily. It's a curse that's placed on someone. You know, in, deep inside the Rougarou is a person that's trying to be freed from this curse. And there is one possible way out. 
even though they are this very dangerous creature, there's still a chance of redemption or of reversing this curse and bringing them back into um, society and civilization. One of the versions of the legend is that a person will be cursed with the Rougarou, and then after 101 days, they can pass it on to another person. Should you stumble onto the path of one of these desperate hunters, forget the crucifix and silver bullets. Your best defense here is a piggy bank. One of the more popular ways to ward off a Rougarou is with the usage of 13 pennies. Well, if you take 13 pennies in front of your door, Rougarou, when he comes out at night, he's going to look and he's going to count. The lore says that once a human turns into a Rougarou, they forget how to count past 12. They'll continuously count to 12 and then back to 12 and then back to 12 until the sun comes up and then they're heading back home, turning into human form. The Rougarou is obsessed with counting, but he is not very good at it. So math is your friend if a Rougarou is around. <laughs> Even monsters have their quirks. But don't let that fool you. The Rougarou is still one of the most dangerous threats out there. I think that the Rougarou is personally one of the scariest things out there. Not necessarily because of what it is, but the possibility that any one of us can become the Rougarou. He's huge um, and he's fast. And he's dangerous. It's funny that he can't count all that well, but <laughs> you know, we all have days like that. I would say just make sure if you're in France or Louisiana to keep 13 objects handy, just in case. But pennies won't help you when it comes to our next paranormal terror. Because this next monster is so old, it was haunting well before America even had a currency. And still, its hold on this country grows stronger every day. It's a state that is known for suburban sprawl and sandy shorelines. But its hunting ground is a huge swampy wasteland. Coming in at number six on our scariest monster countdown is the ghoul of the Garden State. Meet the Jersey Devil. Deep in the pine barrens of southern New Jersey, in a forest where not much grows outside of pine trees, lurks the infamous Jersey Devil. The Jersey Devil is a kind of mix of different creatures. It's got bat-like wings. It's got a horse-like head. It's got horse hooves. It's got a devil tail, a tail with the, the kind of point at the end. And it's also upright. One of the most unique aspects of the Jersey Devil is its connection with humans. Not only its interaction with them, but seemingly coming from the body of a human. By all accounts, this creature should have come out of Dr. Frankenstein's lab. When the Jersey Devil first appeared, New Jersey was a colony, not a state. The Jersey Devil is one of the oldest legends in the United States, at least. It's from 1735, a full 40 years before the United States became a country. Like, it's been around for a long time, and all of it just spurred from literally a birth gone wrong. Mother leads. She was 50 years old, and she's expecting her 13th kid. Unlucky number 13. Mother Leeds lived out in the Pine Barrens and had 12 children to care for. So when she became pregnant with her 13th child, she muttered that she would rather have the devil as a child than another mouth to feed. But be careful what you wish for, because Mother Leeds soon gave birth to an offspring that would make Rosemary's baby look like an angel. So once the child came out, they said that originally the child was perfectly fine. There was nothing wrong. But then all of a sudden, it started to get hooves, it got wings, and it basically turned into this demonic creature. The creature devoured its entire family and then flew out of the chimney 
into the Pine Barrens area, where it has been terrorizing people ever since. So the Pine Barrens is a million acres of woodland. It's extremely dense. There's a lot of animals in there, dangerous animals. It has sort of a reputation for being a scary place. I know the Native Americans were a little bit afraid of the Pine Barrens, of, the, of that section of the forest. Early Americans often, if people were discovered as witches or witch doctors, they would ostracize them out into the Pine Barrens. So there's definitely sort of a reputation for witchcraft and spooky things going on out there. Over the years, the Jersey Devil has been known to attack trolleys and kill countless livestock. Even now, nearly three centuries since his birth, the menacing monster continues to make his presence known. There are more sightings today of the Jersey Devil than nearly at any time in history. The thing is, for that creature to have lived for so long, it's obviously something that's not of this world. It's some different type of creature because so many people have reported seeing it and some people have captured it on camera. One of the most recent sightings of the Jersey Devil came in 2017. A father and his sons driving through the Pine Barrens say they saw a strange creature through the trees. They have some photographs of it, which clearly shows something out in the field. And from where it was standing to how tall it was would suggest something between five and seven feet tall. It's a little blurry, so you can't quite make out what it is, but it doesn't look like a human. Though these men were able to run off without a scratch, not all are so lucky. Only time will tell how much longer this horrific beast will torment the residents of New Jersey. The amazing thing about something like the Jersey Devil is how it has outlasted the many changes our culture has taken. The Jersey Devil belongs on the Mount Rushmore of creatures of America because it has a long lifespan. A lot of legends come and go. They're forgotten about. But the Jersey Devil has broke out of that confine where it's one of the best known legends in America. This reputation doesn't seem to bother the locals one bit. Obviously, the New Jersey NHL team are known as the Devils. Many communities in New Jersey will have museums set up for the Jersey Devil. I believe it is technically even their state demon. But no amount of pop culture appeal can change the fact that coming face to snout with the real Jersey Devil is a living nightmare. Those gigantic wings in your face, the hooves chasing you down the darkened trail in the woods. Something I would not want to encounter. Still, there's some comfort in the fact that the Jersey Devil is grounded in one place. But 700 miles away, in a small Tennessee town, residents are haunted by an even greater menace. One that can appear out of thin air. And if this cunning shapeshifter doesn't keep you on the straight and narrow, we've got another waiting in the wings whose whales alone are enough to scare even the most fervent of sinners. We're only halfway through our quest for the scariest monster in America, and already we've come face to face with the blood-sucking chupacabra in Texas, and the ominous black-eyed children in Vermont. We've uncovered the enormous octopus that strangled swimmers in Oklahoma, and the shape-shifting voodoo who feasts on the blood of sinners in Louisiana. And who could forget the oldest beast of them all, the New Jersey Devil. But our top five monsters are still to come. And each one is more frightening than the last. Up next, we're traveling to the land of rolling hills, where the fear-inducing lady at number five on our list is known to summon spirits far beyond any element on Earth. It's the Tennessee Bell Witch. Hey, 
hearing about the Bell Witch, I thought the Bell Witch was an actual witch, when it turns out that it's actually some sort of supernatural being. We see it manifest in a number of different ways. Scary animal configurations, large birds, a ghost girl in the woods. We are told that it has hands, at least, because several people report shaking its hands. One person describes like a demure, sort of soft female hand. Another person describes a hairy, devilish hand. This entity could imitate and uh, use the same voice and completely repeat everything that you had said. Whether it was a prayer, it would preach your prayer to you. If you sing a song, it would completely sing the song back to you. Word for word. A lot of people were very, very bothered by that because first they're thinking, what is this? Is this a demon? Why is this messing with us? The Bell Witch is extremely scary, right? Because there is dimensional entities that are walking among us and apparently able to affect your physical surrounding, if not just your physical being. So it's not far-fetched to me that these things happen. The story of the Bell Witch actually takes place in the mid to late 1800s in Tennessee. A witch was terrorizing the Bell family on their farm. We used to talk about it some, especially around Halloween. And uh, since I'm a descendant of the Bell family, so I was always asking my grandmother, I was uh, saying, hey, what do you know about the Bell Witch? The most common version of the story that I've heard is that the Bell family, John and his wife and his kids, moved into the area, got some land. Um, and in the same area, Kate Batts lived with her husband, Frederick. But after Frederick is injured in a farming accident, he struggles to support his family. That's when he's forced to make a land trade with the Bells. Kate Batts, feeling that her husband was taken advantage of, swore to have revenge on the Bell family. It was said that Kate then initiates a seance and ritual to curse the Bell family and their farm as she was alleged to be an occultist demonic witch. In the years since, there have been strange happenings up at the Bell farm. Around 1817, John Bell is walking the property and he sees what he believes to be a dog with a rabbit's head. Obviously, he was really freaked out and he unloaded on it with his gun. And supposedly, when he went to go check on the animal that he had just shot, it disappeared. Right after this, uh, John's daughter, Betsy, sees a girl swinging from a branch in the woods and uh, then realizes that that girl's not actually there. Over time, the incidents only get stranger. They would see a girl in a green dress or they would see a bird or even apparently there was a dog, it was a black, large black dog that would follow one of their servants to their houses every morning. Convinced these beings have been conjured up by their occultist neighbor, the Bells begin referring to the presence as Kate Bat's old witch. Today, the spirit is better known as the Bell Witch. Usually when it comes to witches, we think of them as shapeshifters that turn into different animals so that they can move around freely without being caught doing any sort of actions. Really, we would describe this now as a poltergeist. There's knocking on the walls, bed sheets pulled off of people. They started hearing what sounded like what they described as rats gnawing on the floorboard, or maybe even gnawing on the bedpost. This eventually escalated into the children waking up with bruising and scratches and bleeding. And um, one of the girls was even tied to the bed by her hair and beaten in the middle of the night. Word of mouth was huge. As people would travel, they go, hey, did you hear about the Bell family? They got this weird spirit going on. They're trying to figure out what's happening. 
So people from all around that region were coming in to see what was going on. Of course, it spread like wildfire because a lot of people that were going there were having experiences. The, the spirit would talk to them, it would sing to them, and then they would go out and say, hey, this really happened. In 1843, Kate Batts dies, and the town has high hopes that the curse will go with her. But nearly 200 years later, the Bell Witch still has a hold on this small Tennessee town. When you get a monster or a creature, that strikes a certain nerve. It tends to outlast generations. It said over the several year period, we're talking about hundreds if not thousands of people who pass through the town with the hopes of uh, experiencing the Bell Witch. I think people are so entranced by the world of cryptids, this adventure of who are these people, who are these monsters, who are these ghosts. And when I was a kid, I had learned about the Bell Witch House, where you can actually go and visit. So not only is her spirit present in the house, it's also present outside of the house. A lot of people came to explore the Bell House, um, including Andrew Jackson at one point. And what's really cool about this is they could hear the witch's voice from the woods. There's a cave on the property that is still open to this day. You can go for tours. People say that she might be hiding out there. When it comes to the Bell Witch, it almost works in like the same way with demons or with spirits. They feed on your fear, whether it's an actual witch or a poltergeist. Something was there and something was affecting these people. The question is who she decides to show herself to next. For me, being a descendant, yeah, I'm, I'm a little scared. My anxiety goes up. But what's an attack on an entire family when this next beast sends shockwaves of fear across an entire town that continues to spread across the entire nation? And later, we're bringing you the most horrific monster of all. A beast whose name alone brings fear from coast to coast. He is scary, like very scary. Mostly because I think it's the most likely to be real. Some monsters go right for the kill. Others hold back and allow deadly events to take a toll. That's what haunts residents in West Virginia who've laid eyes on the monster coming in at number four on our list. Some say he has the power to kill without lifting a finger. Watch out for the West Virginia Mothman. So the West Virginia Mothman is probably one of the most popular cryptids out there. When you look at Mothman and you hear about what he looks like, it almost sounds like he's a villain in a comic book story. We're talking about a figure around seven feet tall, glowing red eyes, a 10-foot wingspan. Now, this is not a normal creature by any accounts. The story of the Mothman emerges from the most unassuming of towns, Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Point Pleasant is a very small town. It's really kind of centered on one main strip. Everybody knows everybody kind of feel to the town. And like a lot of rural towns, you don't have to go far outside of the outskirts of the city limits when things get wild and primitive. On November 15th, 1966, a group of friends drives out to a former munitions depot. That's when they see something bizarre. At first glance, it looked like a tall, skinny human, but it didn't have a head on its shoulders. More of just a lump that came up out of the chest where the eyes were set, and these massive wings. At first, they didn't know what they were looking at, and they picked up speed. What they didn't expect was this thing was going to chase them and follow them. This creature took off and kept pace with their car going about 100 miles per hour. They said that they could hear basically his wings hitting the side of the car as they were being chased by him. And as soon as they were able to get away, there was like that moment of debate whether or not to tell the police or anybody in town, oh, we saw this. The witnesses tell their unlikely story. 
that they were chased by a massive man-sized bird with red eyes. Soon dozens of people reported encountering this mysterious monster or apparition. When you have a car full of young people reporting it, that's one thing. But then when you have other area people that had a solid reputation saying, no, oh, this thing is real and it's out there, then it goes to a different level. With all those sightings, the Mothman becomes a huge local news story and soon a national one too. Once it picked up traction, news reports started appearing about different sightings. People started fearing it. So many people pointed to how the red eyes seemed to be hypnotizing them or putting them in some trance-like state. So the Mothman definitely was a terrifying figure. The Mothman fills people with fear, but also questions. What is this strange creature? And where did it come from? Some believed it was an escaped medical experiment. Others believe it was not of this uh, dimension or that it was a demon or demonic-like creature. Whatever its origin, the Mothman is soon as common as coal in West Virginia. Still, it's not the only strange thing around. There's UFO sightings all over West Virginia at the time, and it all kind of culminates in 1967. People were seeing weird lights in the sky, darting about, changing in size, shape, and color. A little more than a year after that first sighting, on December 15th, 1967, commuters are traveling along this bridge that borders West Virginia and Ohio when the legend of the Mothman flies to new heights. All of a sudden, people started reporting that they saw Mothman flying back and forth across the river. And nobody knew why. Nobody knew why he was doing that. But then, a couple seconds later, that's when they realized why. Witnesses watch in sheer horror as the bridge falls apart. 46 people lost their lives in the collapse of the Silver Bridge. Others were injured. Two of the missing were never found. And it has become an integral part of the Mothman legend. It was at that moment where people basically were like, okay, maybe he's a harbinger of death or an omen. So we're gonna see him whenever tragedy is about to happen. Others claim the Mothman is actually a would-be savior, trying to alert people of the danger ahead. There's a lot of debate whether or not Mothman is the harbinger of doom or a warning to something. It's possible that Mothman came, gave his predictions, tried to save people from the bridge collapse, and then just disappeared because his work was done. For years, Mothman stays out of the public eye. Until decades later, when word of a huge man-sized bird with dark red eyes begins circulating. Way beyond West Virginia. Over the years, the Mothman, its habitat seems to have grown where it started out as Point Pleasant on the outskirts of the town, now it covers a vast region. Interestingly enough, the sightings have kind of moved in a northward pattern since 1967. Each one of these sightings shares something in common with that infamous bridge collapse. They all come just before some of the world's biggest disasters. There are stories that the Mothman appeared before the nuclear meltdown of Chernobyl. Another supposed sighting is right before 9-11 happened. There was rumors and conspiracies, and at that point, it wasn't more of a fear of him. It was more of like, oh, he's giving us warning. New Mothman sightings continue to this day, and they show no signs of stopping. Many legends have faded throughout history. If people are not interested in them, they don't start passing them down from generation to generation, they disappear, they fade. The Mothman is the exact opposite. It has only gained steam over the years. Also, the story reached Hollywood to the point where we ended up having a movie with Richard Gere in it. So, how fearful would you be to spot the Mothman overhead? As a kid, I remembered I did live in fear of Mothman, and it did spur my fear of bridges at the same time, too. 
So if Mothman visits your town, the going theory is that it's the harbinger of doom. Maybe he's bringing a disaster with him, or maybe he's warning of it. But either way, a disaster is coming. Catching sight of the Mothman is usually just the beginning of a nightmare. But our next ominous creature has racked up quite a haunting past of her own. One that she's more than willing to make you pay to help her forget. Our countdown of America's 10 scariest monsters has brought us face to face with beasts of all shapes and sizes. But there are only three monsters left. And they're the top of the heap for a reason. They're the most frightening, fear-inducing creatures the country has to offer. Even if that's not how some may seem on the surface. It might surprise you to learn that some have described this next supernatural being as the most beautiful woman they've ever seen. When they hear her wailing in the dark, they are tempted to run and help. But should you find yourself in this scenario while visiting Arizona, you may be under the spell of number three on our list. In which case, the only place you should be running is far away. Look out for La Llorona. La Llorona means the wailing woman or the weeping woman. The way that I heard the legend of La Llorona told for the very first time when I was a kid is that centuries ago, there was the most beautiful woman in the world and her name was Maria. She fell in love with a man. She was seduced and became his mistress and had children with him and they were very happy for a while. Then tragedy struck, either through the man leaving her for another woman or mental illness where she snapped, went psychotic, lost her mind. She was so enraged and desperate and furious and jealous that she drowned the children that she had had with him. And as punishment for this murder, she has been condemned to wander the night looking for her lost children. And so the legend goes that every night when it's dark and foggy near a body of water, La Llorona appears as this ghostly apparition that is crying. To this day, there are countless sightings of the weeping woman by the lake. She does appear very consistently, whether it's near a lake or a river, um, or whether it's in these more intimate spaces, like behind people in their cars. There are stories of teenagers waking up and seeing La Llorona standing at the foot of their bed, weeping. And so this idea that she, she could be anywhere, that she could even be in your home, speaks to how, how powerful she is. La Llorona's normally spotted at night, but not always dressed in a gown, a nice flowing, usually white gown. She's wearing this kind of wedding dress, white and tattered, and she's often wearing a veil, a white veil, and she has very, very long dark hair as well. Some people say that she is soaking wet because she came out of that water. They say that she can be beautiful or she can be scary looking like old. So she really is quite chameleonic and resourceful in that way. Some say that her appearance changes to suit each intended target. When she appears to men, she's seen as a very sexy woman, a very, very romanticized version of this woman. And most often, La Llorona is approaching people she wants to offer moral guidance. So if one or to meet La Llorona after, say, a night of drinking or out on the road when you should be at home. Should you survive, it's a very startling message that says, you know, get your act together. <laughs> Ideally, they'll turn from their wicked ways. If not, they'll pay the price. They could die. They could just go insane or just be mentally unstable for the rest of their life. Witnesses say La Llorona also targets children, 
still grieving over the loss of her own. La Llorona might be the best babysitter you could ask for. Parents use her as a way to not only discipline their children, but to keep them in line that if you do not get home when I ask, La Llorona will come looking for you. It's a mom thing, I think. Now moms are scary. She's got that going on too. If reports are any indication, La Llorona has no shortage of targets. We have well over 100 years of sightings of her. She is alive. She is along the river. She really is there. She's there. People believe in La Llorona, and they always have, and people always will. I've never seen any indication that this legend is waning in its strength and popularity, and I'm sure it never will. While people may have different ideas of what La Llorona looks like, Almost everyone can agree on one thing. She's terrifying. Even though I may not be a male or a kid, that does scare me a lot. Like, I wouldn't want to see her. I wouldn't want to hear her. I would just be leery of her because encounters with her don't tend to go well. And if you encounter her, you probably shouldn't be doing what you're doing. may hold the Southwest captive with her frigid stare. But in the tundra of Minnesota, there's an even colder monster. Who's got an insatiable appetite for only one thing, human flesh. Monsters in America list and traveling way up north to track down our next beast. Coming in at number two is a creature so vicious, it's known to kill anyone that falls under its influence. It's the Minnesota Wendigo. The Wendigo is the perfect embodiment of the harshness of the northern winters, the subarctic freezing temperatures, lack of food, crippling wind and snow and ice. It shows up in time of famine during the winter when food is scarce. People are at their weakest mentally and physically. And that's when the Wendigo will show up as this elemental creature of the winter, of the cold. Many times it's seen as like this very tall being with antlers, its teeth are super sharp. I've also heard a lot of people say that he has no lips because he's chewed them off because he's so hungry. Oh my goodness. And this skeleton on legs has some surprising superpowers. He is supernaturally fast. He runs with the speed of the wind. He has superhuman strength, can uproot trees, can throw cars, things of that nature. The Wendigo also has super strong senses. They're gonna hear you coming a mile away. They'll smell you before you even know they're there. The Wendigo uses these tools to secure its next meal. But you won't find this beast munching on car bumpers like South Carolina's Lizard Man. It takes something far more sinister to sate the Wendigo's appetite. What sets the Wendigo apart from nearly every other monster is that while other monsters may have sinister motives and plans, the Wendigo has one goal and one goal only, devour human flesh. It needs to eat, it needs to feed. Eat flesh, eat flesh, consume, consume, consume. It's not actively in the background going about its own business. We are its business and it's looking for us. This taste for human flesh draws comparisons to another well-known monster. A lot of people make the comparison between zombies and Wendigo. And although maybe by appearance, they seem semi-similar, skeletal and gaunt, 
But where zombies are thought to be mindless creatures of the undead, the Wendigo is thought to be very intelligent. So they're cunning as well as ravenous. Possible Wendigo caught on camera. <laughs> He's basically like the best hunter you could ever think of. He has thought of it all and he knows exactly how to get to his prey. Along with its size, strength, and speed, the Wendigo has another weapon, its brain. This beast can play some pretty clever mind games. One of the beliefs is that the Wendigo has the ability to mimic human voices. If you hear a friend's voice, but you know that they are either further away from you or they're not with you at all. You do not listen to that voice. You do not listen to it. It's a lure. It's trying to bait you to come to it so that it can eat you. So if you're out wandering in the snow-covered woods, how do you know if there's a Wendigo on your trail? Just follow your nose. The Wendigo. It has a very putrid smell. Many people have equated it to rotting flesh. There's another sign the Wendigo is nearby. Even in the bitter cold, you'll feel the temperature take a sharp and sudden drop. He has a heart made of ice. And you know he's around because often he'll bring winter storms or cold with him. But perhaps the most difficult sign to ignore is the piercing shriek of a Wendigo just before he attacks. Hearing the Wendigo scream, someone you know is going to die very shortly. If you do find yourself facing off against a Wendigo, what next? Step one, panic. Step two, look for something sharp. You need in some way to take out his heart because that is the source of its possession. And because in many tellings, the Wendigo's heart is made of ice. The most common way to defend yourself against a Wendigo, if you're able to, is to cut out their heart and melt it over a fire. However, if this thing is real, I don't think anyone is getting close enough to it to do that before it tears you apart. To kill a Wendigo, I mean, good luck. <laughs> to all who know him, the Wendigo is the kind of creature you'd never want to meet on a cold winter's day or night. It's humans. So in a sense, if I were to come face to face with a Wendigo, nobody would see me right after that because I'm gone. I'm dinner, basically. <laughs> the Wendigo, there's nothing like it ever. It's the scariest, most terrifying, deadliest monster I hope you never encounter. But there's still one slot in our top 10 scariest monsters countdown. And we've saved the worst for last. Up next is a cryptid that needs no introduction. It's a monster as American as apple pie, but a whole lot deadlier. our map of monsters to find the scariest creatures around from the Louisiana Bayou to small town West Virginia the icy plains of Minnesota to the New Jersey Pine Barrens Now we're going to the home turf of the scariest monster of all. Coming in at number one on our top 10 countdown, it's the biggest, baddest beast of them all. Watch out for the Washington Bigfoot. If cryptozoology had a poster child, that poster child would definitely be Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Bigfoot is a large, humanoid creature and he inhabits wooded areas we have accounts of these creatures being very large very 
muscular and bulky. These are apex predators when it comes down to it. Uh, the king of the forest, if you will, because they are the largest thing out there. A lot of people equate his appearance to maybe that of a gorilla, maybe that of a bear. It makes you question, am I in danger? Tales of these towering creatures go all the way back to indigenous people who believe that Bigfoot stands as a reminder of the untamed beast within us all. Most of the more respected theories about where Bigfoot came from is that it's practically a missing link, if you will, a part of our chain of evolution that has been hidden. Over the years, increased sightings of these savage creatures have led to rising panic. There were all kinds of accounts in cities and towns across America where they were encountering giant hairy men covered in hair from top to bottom. They named them wild men of the woods. And when they started seeing these creatures, they took it in a little different manner that they're fearful. There's something that should be hunted. They have a very long gait. They're very quick when they want to be, very strong. And I think for a lot of people, that's the fear of encountering them. There are violent reports. For example, in 1924, up near Mount St. Helens, these gold miners were setting up their mine, and they are surrounded by ape men, which throw rocks at the cabin, punching the walls of the cabin, trying to get in, trying to break the door down. They're shooting at them with rifles up until daybreak when they go away. When they come out of the cabin, they find long footprints on the ground all surrounding the cabin. But it wasn't until the 1950s that one close encounter gave the beast a new name. 1958, a man named Jerry Crew and his logging crew all began to experience some strange things. So they wake up in the morning and find their oil canisters, and I mean 45 gallon oil drums tossed into the creek below and a couple people report seeing a large humanoid-like creature. They're finding large human-like footprints. A journalist named Andrew Gonzoli comes up with the term Bigfoot, and that catches fire. There are different beliefs as to what Bigfoot is. Some believe that Bigfoot is for perhaps an interdimensional being that comes in and out of our, our reality at will. It's this supernatural ability that might help explain why sightings of Bigfoot now stretch way beyond the Pacific Northwest. You have the East Coast variety, often called pine apes. You have down in the south in the swamps, in Louisiana, actually, it's called uh, the skunk ape. A lot of the time people feel like they're feeling watched. And I think all of us as human beings can feel kind of off when we feel like somebody is staring at us, unwarranted. People say, I didn't see him, but I felt him. I know he was interested. I know he was watching. I believe that Bigfoot is something we should be cautious of. It is not uncommon to find um, deer out in the woods that have had their uh, livers ripped out. One boy from East Tennessee actually came face to face with this colossal creature. Though it was nearly 15 years ago, his dad, Matt Sieber, will remember the day forever. As a lot of young kids do in the summertime, they play video games all night and they sleep all day. So he was doing a chore for me in the middle of the night. And as he was doing that, a Sasquatch, a Bigfoot, approached him. The 15-year-old stood there, stunned, as he considered this creature's frightening reputation. It is very possible that they could have a violent streak. I've heard some stories of some pretty chilling experiences where some violence took place. Uh, people were actually killed. You have to remember, you're on their turf. Luckily, Matt says his son was able to slip away without injury. But the encounter left a lasting mark. 
My son, who's now in his 30s, uh, does not go outside at night. It is truly messed with his mind. He's afraid of the dark, basically, and he's a grown man. It's incidents like these that have led one man from East Tennessee to take action. So this is the only Bigfoot patrol car in the country. It's a 2005 lifted Ford Crown Victoria. Um, it's a police interceptor. It's a retired Missouri State Trooper car. Nate's modified this cruiser with everything you'd need to take the world's most dangerous passenger. It still has the prisoner partition. It has the plastic seats in the back. It has steel door panels and window bars. And we've also added the canine window bars in the back window, which are super rare. It took me about three years to pilot them. It could break out of a regular car door if you wanted to. Even with his big footproof vehicle, Nate's hoping he'll never have to make a Sasquatch citizen's arrest. I don't feel like it's a smart idea to mess with a creature that's at least twice my height and probably three times my weight. I'm not a tiny guy, but that scares the crap out of me. This is a creature at the top of the food chain that can take you down as easily as a grizzly would. I think that they are very powerful creatures that deserve to be respected and approached with a great deal of caution. Fear and fascination of this furry beast continue to fuel Bigfoot's cultural appeal. He's now the headliner at festivals all around the country. I think this festival has a lot of draw to it because um, Bigfoot's really mysterious and interesting. The dimensions or the pictures of the foot at that point, uh, well, that, that convinces me that there's something out there. An event like this, you get to be around the like-minded people, of course, and sharing stories, different techniques. And we get to listen to other people and their tips, and we can share what we do, you know, and learn a lot that way. But is it enough to prepare any one of these people for encountering Bigfoot in the wild? Very often, these people who see these creatures are just going about their business. They're walking their dogs. They're on their way home from work or going to work. They're out visiting family members. He is often spotted at a distance. Eyewitness reports suggest that he makes various noises, like knocking, um, sometimes whistling. I think I heard a knock that time, too. Sometimes a screech or a scream can be heard off in the woods. I think it's time to go. Sometimes people who see Bigfoot also see these balls of light. I found it. That are near that area right before or after or during their Bigfoot sighting. This is interesting. The balls of light that people are seeing, they are sometimes different colors. There's the green ones that are, they look very much like the same color green that's in a traffic light. And it happens so frequently that the, the locals there had developed a saying of, when the green lights appear, Bigfoot is near. North Dakota resident Jen Cruz has yet to see Bigfoot up close, but she's determined to face her fear. Which is why she put together a team known as the She Squatchers to track down this elusive cryptid. I thought, well, I'll give this a try. I'll find some ladies to go out with me. We found a place where somebody had had a recent encounter. And it was fairly close to where I lived on the Cass Lake Indian Reservation. A native man had been fishing in his canoe, and there was a large Sasquatch that was about knee deep in the shallows of the water that was aggressively moving towards him as he was coming into shore. One night, Jen and her team prowled the woods near that lake, tempting the beast to make a repeat appearance. When we were driving along this little road, I started feeling this interesting sensation that I had never felt before. And so we stopped the car, we got out. 
It was so dark that we couldn't see anything. And so I had my equipment in hand already, and one of the girls handed me this thermal camera. Now I'm pointing it out in front of the car, and on the left side of the road, right where the tree line is, maybe about 50 feet in front of the car, there was somebody standing there. So when I first saw it, I thought it was one of my team members because it looked like a person. It was a humanoid shape. Jen says she soon took a closer look and realized it wasn't one of her teammates. In fact, it wasn't human at all. It had more of a conal-shaped head, very thick trapezius, almost like it had no neck whatsoever and wide shoulders. So I put the camera down and I looked just to see if I could see it with my eyes and I didn't. But then I put the camera back up and it was gone. Some say Jen was lucky. She walked away without a scratch. Next time might be different. If we really think about like the, the food web, right? He's, he's clearly bigger than us and stronger than us, then we would be next in line. Bigfoot is scary, like very scary, mostly because I think it's the most likely to be real of all the ones that I've looked into. I mean, you're talking about something that can sneak up on you completely silently and just watch you. That is so terrifying. <laughs> What's most terrifying of all is that nobody has ever been able to catch Bigfoot. At least not anyone who's lived to tell the tale. We don't know what happened to these people if Bigfoot has gotten them, if Bigfoot has eaten them. It's crazy. But even if a trip to Washington isn't on your bucket list, America's scariest monsters are closer than you think. That ain't right. Get in the house. Get in the house. You know, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, at any point in time, you could experience something that is far outside the realm of what we consider to be reality. Let's go. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. That not knowing, that wanting to know propels people forward. You want to be scared. You want to go and experience it. Monster that can't be found anywhere else. It's the last bit of mystery left in the world. Things that are nocturnal and run around at night. I mean, what is that if not a monster? 